Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, May meeting, uh, the final meeting of this uh, academic year, hard to believe. Um, as you know, we're required to have four meetings a year, and this is uh, in the academic year, and this is our fourth. Um, and so uh, some of us, uh, some of the council members aren't here today, but we didn't want to postpone the meeting because we'd be pushing it into June beyond graduation. So uh, we went forward with the meeting, but we do have a quorum. So let's go around uh, the table of council members to introduce themselves first, and then we'll go around and meet uh, Maury's team. So Frank Trotta. Margot Garant. Laura Thomas, Vice President Diesel. Harold Schulon Jr. Alexander Carlutsis. Good, and do we have uh, Chris Hahn on the phone? I am on the phone, Kevin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, yeah. Chris. Good. And good morning to my good friend, Chris Damiano, a great supporter of Stony Brook University. Uh, so, Maury, you have members of your team here with you? Yes. Um, I, and rather than my calling on them, there are so many I'm going uh, start to just start. So we'll just start with Judy and work our way down on this side. Judy Griman, Chief Deputy President. Hi, Carl Leslie, Provost. Al Foz, Executive Vice President for Health Sciences. Good morning, Jen Shivers, SUP Finance Administration and IT. Hello, we're Kato, VP for Student Affairs. Good morning, Vice President of Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer. Good morning, I was Zachary's Vice President for the Class Risk Management, Chief Security Officer. Bill Warren, VP of Marketing and Communications. Rich Feeder, Vice President for Research and in Brookhaven Lab Affairs. Good. Uh, Kevin Reed, Associate Dean, School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. Hey, good morning, Fred Skang, Executive Director of the Long Island State Veterans Hall. Good morning, Carol Baum, CEO at Stony Brook University Hospital. Good morning, Rachel Kavanaugh, Executive Assistant to the Chief Deputy to the President. All right. And Rachel, thanks for all you do and keeping all the council members <laughs> in the loop, informed, and all the information to us. You do a great job. Uh, so thank you. And Maury, thanks to your team. It's always great to have them here in case any questions come up uh, from the council members. <clears throat> um, we are going to uh, uh, make sure we're going to be out by 1030 today. Um, so uh, we got a, a very informative agenda and um, we'll start off with the approval. No, we're going to start off like we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance, led by our Sheriff, Errol Toulon. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and, and justice for all. Thank you. And now uh, the approval of the minutes uh, from March uh, 6, 2023, uh, moved by Frank, seconded by Father Alex, are there any comments, revisions, additions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None. Uh, the minutes are approved. Chairman's report, I really have not nothing to report other than I share in the excitement of the university on things we'll be briefed on here, especially the, the huge victory of uh, Stony Brook winning the uh, Governor's Island competition, which we'll hear more from Maury and Kevin on. And also uh, the state budget finally done, like most budget, good, bad, and some eh, in there, um, and we'll hear some of that from uh, uh, Judy um, in her presentation. So uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Maury for her president's report. Good morning, everyone. So glad to have you with us. Um, and indeed, it's been a really great semester here at Stony Brook. So I wanna update you on a few things, and it's because it's not just Governor's Island. We've got a lot of other good stuff uh, that's been going on. Let me start with telling you about the Simon Stem Scholars Program. Um, you heard about this gift uh, made last year and announced last year that was gonna allow us to create an undergraduate program focused on attracting really amazing students who were interested in STEM, but who were also interested in the issues around diversity in STEM with the idea that these remarkable undergraduate students would come to Stony Brook University, would from the beginning get the kinds of both peer support, staff support, but also experiences that were gonna help prepare them for PhD or MD, PhD education in STEM fields. Um, we had the signing ceremony for our inaugural cohort. This year, we wanted to begin with a class of 25 just to make sure that 
We had everything set up on campus for these students to succeed. Next year, we will go to our target of 50 students per class. So by the time we fill out four classes, we will, be, we will have 200 students on this campus who are getting holistic wraparound support to prepare them for PhD um, experiences down the road. So it will begin with a summer bridge program research experiences beginning year one, support for summer research experiences, for study abroad, for unpaid internships, whatever is appropriate for their course of study. Um, and we had the most kind of overwhelming response to this program. And in the first year, we're so excited about that, right? Because we're just beginning those recruiting pipelines. We're just beginning to build those relationships with people all over the nation, really, to understand about this opportunity here. So we had more than a thousand applicants for the 25 spots. We invited about 110 to be part of the interview process. Um, and we have 27 um, in our first class with, from our initial um, acceptances, over 70% of them said yes to us. Um, half of our scholars are from New York City, 40% are from Long Island and upstate, and the remaining 11% um, are from out of state. Um, so we're really great first class. A third of them um, are interested in math, physics, and computer science, about a third in engineering, and about a third in you know, the variety um, of other sciences. Um, the average high school GPA and SAT of the class are in the 99th percentile. So, I mean, these are wow. just remarkable students. Um, and we just had the signing ceremony Friday um, in New York City at the Simons Foundation, and it was an extraordinary event, just an amazing group of students. Um, so in that class include a whole bunch of National Merit Scholars, a Hispanic Heritage Youth Award Gold Medal recipient, um, we have National Junior Science and Humanities Symposium uh, winners, and we're just so impressed by this student and by these students and so grateful to the Simons Foundation for their funding this program so generously. All of these students are getting full rides to cost of attendance plus um, all of those other sort of supportive things. So they will be on campus with us most of the summer. Um, in a summer bridge program that's really uh, set up to really get let them hit the ground running um, in the fall. And what's the name of the program? Simon's, well, if you want, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> the Stony Brook Simon Stem Scholars Program. Very great. Say yeah. that one 10 times fast. I won't, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> and um, it, this is going to be an annual thing, so we're going to shoot for about, you know, um, 20 50, 50 a year oh, wow. in steady state. Awesome. So it, by... The time we fill out, we'll have 200 of these scholars on our campus. Cool. That's great. Really great. Yep. Um, and let's just say, of the students who come for interviews, a lot of them get to know us in ways that they didn't before and will yield a lot of those students as well. Um, so it's really going to, it gives us a recruiting arm um, to also continue to strengthen the students that we have here. It's such a great program. We're so nice. excited. Um, Busy spring on campus, as it always mm -hmm. is, uh, celebrating SBU traditions like Earth Fest, Brook, I mean, Earth Stock, Brook Fest, um, and Roth Regatta, which was last weekend. Um, not this past one, but the one before. Um, so it's really great to have these amazing, uh, you know, sort of campus community affirming events happening. Um, and Rick and his team are so central to our success, um, as well as our um, undergraduate student government organization and they've really done a great job this year with you know events and school spirit and so forth so Especially we're really appreciative so many of them. those events were canceled over the last few years right? exactly so i'm glad the kids got to uh, experience that especially the seniors yeah we missed out on a bunch yep exactly um so another thing of interest during earth stock um we made uh we announced that we are taking the steps necessary to set aside the majority of the Ashley Schiff Preserve um, to, pr to sort of preserve the preserve from any future development. Um, it is a really important ecosystem from a biodiversity standpoint where, you know, on our campus. Um, and so that has been done. It is something that 
um, students and many of our faculty on this campus have been asking for for decades. Um, and we did the studies and the research to make sure that it's something we could do. Um, and so that is done. It will preserve, be preserved for years into the future. Uh, let's move on to state budget. Judy's going to say a few more things, but I just want to set it in a, a bit of a framework. Um, as you all know, it has been um, more than a decade since we have seen really significant support for higher education um, coming out of Albany. And so um, our team, which for years has been working on advocacy, um, has really gotten traction here in the last couple of years and especially this year. Um, we worked very co uh, closely with Governor Hochul's team and we were so pleased that in last year's state of the address and then again in this year's state of the address, she spent considerable time talking about higher education. She has very publicly acknowledged how important higher education is to the future of this state and very specifically has acknowledged the importance of having research institutions that are both involved in <clears throat> undergraduate research, but are also involved in graduate and professional research, where the faculty are also doing the kinds of research that lead to discovery and innovation. All of that, an important part of the ecosystem of the state for improving economic development far into the future. And her budget reflected those priorities, mm -hmm. um, which we were deeply appreciative of. Chancellor King, who began his work in January, very quickly jumped into the advocacy efforts and is 100% behind the governor's plan, both for strong higher ed support, but very strong support for the flagship institutions and the differential level of resources they need to be able to deliver on their mission. Um, and we also, in addition to the governor, got traction with the legislature as well. So we are really appreciative um, of what came out of Albany this legislative cycle. So we will get additional capital for this campus, which we so desperately need. Um, Two billion in deferred maintenance across our campus infrastructure, um, which harms us in so many ways. The most sort of painful of that is having labs that do not support the research of your faculty. Mm -hmm. Um, and so additional capital that allows us to invest <clears throat> in upgrading those labs or adding new where that is appropriate, because sometimes it is cheaper to tear down and rebuild um, than it is to renovate. So that kind of flexible capital that we can use on our campus um, is enormously important. Yes, and Maury, I, 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 I'm so glad you mentioned the governor because I don't think uh, Governor Hochul gets enough credit because of her advocacy for SUNY. And while we may not get everything we want, if we didn't start off with Governor Hochul's high bar for Stony Brook, we, and we wouldn't wind up after negotiating with the legislature as to where we you know, wind up, which is still right. pretty good. So uh, kudos to her, yes. Yep. So we got capital. We got operating aid, which has not gone up in over a decade. Wow. And mm -hmm. we got an endowment match. And this is new for New York State. This has been done in many other states where to try to encourage the building of a culture of philanthropy, the state will make an endowment match. So for this year, there was 500 million set aside in the budget at a one to two match across the four university centers. Hmm. The law says that, or bill, whatever we should call it, that the first of that 500 million, that no university can get more than 200 million, 40% for the first three years. And then after three years, if there's any left over, whoever then next is first to get it can get it, right? And for us as a young institution, um, this gives us a great sort of opportunity to go to our friends and supporters and say, invest in Stony Brook and the state at one to two will match your donation. So we're really sure. excited about that. We are going to need to continue very strong advocacy. This does not fix our financial issues. This is an amazing start, 
Um, but the reality is there are future labor contracts about to be negotiated. If we desperately need the state to return to what they used to do, which is to fund whatever labor contracts they negotiate, right? And as we all know, that went away in the past and has been the source of our financial troubles in the past. So we're gonna need to continue to advocate very strongly and very loudly, but we're off to a great start. Um, so there will be some new money coming in and operating aid um, and under Jed Shiver's leadership as part of our strategic budgeting process, we will review budget requests from all the areas, which are about, what, seven to eight times the amount of available new money we're going to have, and we'll have to make choices within that. Um, so what we really want to talk to you about and what we're so excited about um, is our selection to be the anchor institution of a consortium of institutions to run a climate science solution center on Governor's Island. This is the outcome of a two year process. Um, and it is the beginning of really exciting work that we will do with both global and local partners who are engaged in climate issues from a variety of different angles. And what's so exciting about this proposal, I think is the cross sector partnership that we are building out of this. Um, it will run under the banner of the New York Climate Exchange. It is set up as a separate 501c3. Stony Brook is the anchor institution for that. Of the board seats of the separate 501c3, we have 50% of them and our partners have 50% of them. Um, so we are really excited about all that. I'm going to talk about it at much greater length, as are some of my team members who are going to tell you a little bit more about it. But before we move to a longer discussion of Governor's Island, does anyone have any questions? And Judy's going to present more on budget as well. So, Maury, you sound like you've been dealing with the New York State budget for, yeah. you know, dozens of years. <laughs> <laughs> you've really, in a short time, mastered it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an necessary part of the job. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, any questions from Maury on the president's report? Very good. All right, so let's, if we could, load the slide deck. Thank you. All right. So let us talk about what we have been creating over the last two years. Um, and in addition to some remarks I'm going to give, um, Jed Shivers, my senior vice president for finance administration and IT, um, and Kevin Reed, our associate dean for research um, and associate professor in SOMAS, will also be speaking about certain aspects of what we're doing. Um, we're also going to show you slides that show some of the building renderings um, so that I'll give you, be able to give you a sense of what it is we will be building. Um, before I get into more details, let me just say, this is such an important moment for Stony Brook. This opportunity is such a great thing for this campus. It has brought us international recognition and has created for us new partnerships that are going to help us grow what we do and the impact that we have in research and economic development and deepen our community engagement um, that is very much core to our mission as a public institution. And it is putting us in the room with philanthropic supporters that we would never have gotten into the room with otherwise. Sure. So it just changes the trajectory of what is possible for us in the impact that we can have on Long Island, in New York, and globally for the world. So I am so excited um, about this. And we are doing so on what is really one of the greatest challenges of our time, right? We all are living in a changing planet and understanding and making progress on not only why it's changing and how it's changing, but how we're all gonna adapt to that change. That's really what this program is going to be about. And the reality of making progress on climate change, frankly, we've understood a lot of the why for a few decades now, but we're not making much progress. Um, and why are we not making much progress? Well, in part, because while you can know the science, you've got to change the human behavior. 
And that's what we've really struggled with. And so scientists, if they're only in their silos, they've convinced each other, right? They've convinced the scientific community, right? How we're going to make change is by really working across sectors. And so the idea behind the New York Climate Exchange is we're going to bring together scientists with public policymakers, with commercial entities, with community groups, so that we can work together from the beginning, designing solutions that will work in their communities that can quickly be commercialized and put into implementation and with the policymakers that are gonna have to make change for us to be able to make progress in this. And that is what we're hoping to do. So we hope to become this global convening power to discuss climate science, to demonstrate innovative solutions, and to create and train people for the green jobs of the future. So if I could show you the next slide, please. So here are our port partners. So we are the anchor institution. The core partners who have board seats as part of the New York Climate Exchange are Georgia Tech, the University of Washington, um, both of whom are public AAU institutions doing major work in climate. Pace and Pratt to New York City-based institutions who have deep ties into their local communities, who help us understand how to partner well. Um, with major corporations on the board, both BCG and IBM, who are part of helping us create our research technology accelerator, which is gonna help us get solutions into the market more quickly. And with one of our many community partners, um, goals that is, as it is called, the good old Lower East Side. What is so it? It, yeah. it is a community-based, um, you know, community-based environmental justice group who, is one of dozens of community partners that we have. Because one of the things we've all learned in this process is science is sometimes really good at designing solutions that then when brought back to a community mm -hmm. don't work, right? So the idea is we'll have all these partners sitting at the table, co-designing with us. I've never heard of them actually. Yeah, they're- Have you heard of them? No, but I think- I'm, uh, You're at LMDC, I'm with St. Nicholas Shrine, we're rebuilding it. This is the first time I've ever heard of this. I'm going to look it up. No, but uh, Maury was brilliant. And because remember, it's New, a good idea New, to New, have York, New York City made this decision with the Trust for Public, yeah, yeah, uh, the yeah. Trust for Governance Island. So having a bunch of New York City partners. Oh, I agree. Was, no, I think, uh, but I, very, very strategic. And uh, I no, obviously you paid you off. Do and, it our, and our fur, full list is on the website. So we have about 30 different community based partner organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and we're excited a about that. Idea to do that. Yeah. What's the difference between core partners and affiliates? So partners? core partners have board seats okay. and it's a piece of their commitment to the exchange. And some of that is around their role in fundraising for the exchange okay. as well. The exchange will be paid for entirely philanthropically. Um, and so we have heavy lifts on the fundraising side. Um, although we've already raised $100 million from the Simons Foundation and $50 million from Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, and we get $100 million from the city as part of this. So we're off to a good start, but we got a long way to go. So our affiliate partners include CUNY, obviously really important to this initiative. Um, also NYU and Maritime. So we've got a lot of New York City based partners, which is really great, um, as well as other universities like Duke and the University of Oxford, who are doing a ton of work in climate, um, RIT, um, and then Moody's is another of our partner partners. Um, advisory partners, and, and some of this has to do with their own governance issues as to how tied into an outside entity they can be. Um, but obviously Brookhaven National Lab, you know, they do so much often with our you know, jointly appointed faculty, but also with their staff research in green energy. Um, so they're a really important scientific partner for us. And Herbs is a um, Scandinavian company that works on kind of circular systems, you know, so the green energy technologies um, of the future. So we're excited about that. Um, I'd like to, and this is a huge part of our strength and what really distinguished our proposal from the people against whom we competed is both that we were cross, 
not only did we have a great set of core higher ed partners, but we were really working across sector in ways that actually most of our competitors were not even thinking in that way. So this is what I think really made our proposal so strong. I'd like to ask Kevin if he would say a few words um, about our programming and what's going to be going on on the island, even yeah. before we build a, anything. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so maybe I'll just pick up with one of the aspects of the funding, which is mentioned related to the community partners. So not only are we developing right the ideas or what we'll work at at the exchange through our community partners, actually, that is actually injected multiple times throughout the proposal process. So our, our proposal itself was actually co-designed and co-developed with our community partners, which which there is, as mentioned, there's a whole list of them, but just a, a couple of the other environmental groups that are EJ groups you might know in the city are REACT, um, as well as The Point. Uh, and so these are other ones that we've also worked with, in addition to a whole host of educational uh, partners. Uh, so you could have, you know, the American Museum of Natural History is one of them, the Climate Museum. And, and we did put a, a particular emphasis with our, um, our partners that are already tenants on the island. So these are like the Beam Center, the Harbor School, um, Earth Matter. Uh, and so when we think about the programming, it's really, it's, it's really ambitious, which is I think the most exciting part about it, which is right, in order to, to really advance climate solutions, it's, it's a significant challenge. Um, so it really requires education all the way through K through 12 experiences. So kind of uh, amplifying existing opportunities that already exist on the island uh, for summer camps, field trips, uh, but starting to build more climate and climate solutions programming into that. Um, really through hands-on experiences. So you could imagine working with Earth Matter and talking about sustainability, the sustainability of Governor's Island, the sustainability of the exchange, um, and how students can take that back to their schools or to their communities. Um, and then, of course, the other aspect of it is workforce training. And this is another thing where we're really leveraging our partners. Um, so we have a, a few different uh, groups within the city um, that have a variety of uh, work, workforce training programs. So I, the one I always like to point to is Solar One. Uh, they're this really community-based solar program that's really focused on how do you train right, New York City and New Yorkers um, for the kind of new technologies that are being deployed or as code changes or as, we, as, climate, as, as New York City and New York State work to meet its climate goals. Um, and so uh, a big part of the workforce training is amplifying those existing programs, but also uh, providing a space. Right? Oftentimes, a, a biggest issue for a lot of these organizations is just Right, how do you get people to them? Uh, and having a place that's the New York Climate Exchange, which is where you go to do this type of stuff, uh, will be a, a huge asset. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the other aspect uh, is related to what we do well on campus, right? Educating our undergraduates and our graduate students. And so, uh, it, once this is spun up and there's a physical location, we will actually have space for 100 undergraduates to live on the island and participate in what we're calling a climate solutions study abroad like program. Um, and so it'll be our students, of course, our partners, in which they'll, um, they'll live on the island for a semester, um, just like you would a, another study abroad program. And you'll have the opportunity to you know, have a, a course load that's specific to hands-on learning, you know, actually participating in the sustainability of the island, participating in the circular systems that are being deployed, uh, but also learning about climate change, learning about the impacts in New York and beyond, and really it was a, a, a focus on the environmental justice lens as well. Uh, and then within that, there'll be opportunities for graduate students um, to participate in research projects, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, in which some of them will be able to live on the island, particularly if, you know, sometimes, you know, you need to have 24-7 monitoring or equipment, you know, following the, what's happening in the lab. And so there'll be opportunities for students, uh, graduate students to live on the island, but not just STEM students, graduate students. I mean, we're, we're looking at how we build out programmings for, uh, for <coughs> MBA students um, or, or um, or even those in the arts, uh, because arts is a very important part about communicating the impacts of climate change um, and the reality that it is, as well as the solutions that we might be developing. Um, and so we, I, we, we have a, we call these, these climate solutions fellows. Um, so we have a, a, some vision around how these kind of, when they're on the island, they'll get to work together and learn across those disciplines and also create this unique kind of additive um, aspect. Uh, and then, of course, as already mentioned, is the, the Research and Technology Accelerator Program. And this is really um, thinking about how can we take either ideas that are already on our campus or our partner's campus to kind of break down those silos to work across the partnership as well as with industry um, on research that might you know, be in need of a place to demonstrate or test it. Um, so kind of that 
accelerating. Uh, oftentimes in, in federal funding, research kind of ends at the idea, you know, you get to the idea, you can prove that it's viable, but then how do you get it to commercialization? And of course, we do a lot of that on campus, but this might be an area to specifically do that for, for climate solutions. Um, as well as research that can particularly make use of the coastal urban environment that is Governor's Island in New York City. Right, so we, we have a lot of great examples of this, right, within Southampton and with the research we do right there in the water. But you could imagine that having the urban aspect could also uh, provide new opportunities for focus of research. Um, but the idea is that the, the, the projects in this space aren't meant to be, you know, professor so-and-so will how, now have a lab at, at Governor's Island. It's really meant to be uh, an exchange, so flowing through. And so the idea is there'll be kind of three month to two year long projects at any one time with flexible lab space that'll, that can be you know, flexed into what it needs. Um, and that there'll be a process in which faculty both at our campus and our partners campuses will propose to use that space. Uh, and then of course, once we're more mature, we envision that the exchange will also be applying for opportunities from the federal government for large centers to really become the leader in some of these areas. Um, and then uh, let me just finish with, with talking a little bit about then the, the kind of community engagement side of the programming. And this is kind of just immersed through the entire idea. Uh, and that all of the, the space you saw on the, the first slide, right, all of the first floor will be really public space. It'll be opportunity to engage the public. Maybe they've come to the island to ride their bike around the perimeter or or for I think in the springtime they have dog days on Governor's Island, right? So you might come to Governor's Island for something else, but you might learn a little bit about um, uh, climate change, climate solutions, and actually maybe see some solutions that are being tested right on the island. Uh, but also it'll be a place for convening. There'll be, there'll be places to, to have workshops, expert meetings, um, public meetings around climate solutions. Um, you could imagine partnering with the UN uh, during like water, the water week, which happened a few weeks ago or about a month ago now. Um, and then there'll also be opportunities, of course, for to integrate right, the arts and, and, and all of that into this. And so we have ideas for working with community partners of how we can do this, um, as well as really putting the island um, and the New York Climate Exchange on display as a living laboratory. Um, and kind of being, you, know, you could imagine walking by <coughs> geothermal wells. This is you know, not something that's common in New York City, but an important aspect of sustainability. And you could imagine seeing a, you know, a, displays of how much energy is coming from that and how much energy from the solar panels is being used for other needs on the island and showing how a net zero building um, can really uh, can really transform not only Governor's Island, but then right really putting solutions on display for New York City. So in order for New York City to meet its climate goals, we're not going to tear down every skyscraper and rebuild it, right? We're going to have to think about how we renovate it. Uh, and that's a big part of what we're doing with um, some of the other aspects uh, where we'll be doing renovation for, uh, for the campus life uh, and putting on display of how you can, can do that. Thank you. Let me, let me show you a little bit more about our buildings um, because they are an important part of the living laboratory. Um, so for those of you who've um, not really paid attention to Governor's Island, it, it, with these drawings, looks like everything is there. In fact, <laughs> great architectural <laughs> renderings, because those kind of undulating buildings are the main buildings, the main new buildings that are part of our proposed design. We have been working with the architectural firm SOM, and from the very beginning, they are deeply committed to the same thing we're committed to, right? Which is to use this as an opportunity to demonstrate both new building technologies as well as new energy technologies as a way of demonstrating, showcasing, creating this living laboratory to show New Yorkers and people from around the world that as when they visit Governor's Island, this is what the future could look like, right? Uh, think of it almost as that little bit of that World's Fair kind of site, right? That we used to go to to see, you know, the, the, day, the kitchen of tomorrow, right? This is the building technology of tomorrow. And the really beautiful designs that they have come up with, I mean, I think they're just spectacular. They were really inspired by the waterfront location, the, the sort of sense of waves and the movement of water. It's part of how you come up with those undulating curves. They wanted to respond to the, to the water's edge, but also back to the historic buildings that are on already on Governor's Island, those um, former Coast Guard buildings 
um, because some of those will be rehabbed and refitted to become part of our campus as well. Um, To speak to the skyline, and if you haven't visited Governor's Island, it really is a remarkable experience to be looking back up at Lower Manhattan, to be looking across to the Statue of Liberty, and yet in this space that is so open. Um, And so just really beautiful um, design for this urban waterfront. If I could have the next slide, please. But in addition to being beautiful, and we thought that was an important part of the design, they were also really needed to serve this living laboratory um, goal that we had to show people what future construction should uh, be like. So across the board, really hitting the kinds of goals that if we're all gonna meet our goals for reducing greenhouse gases, this is actually how we should be building. Um, You know, really important to that is meeting all of our energy needs on site entirely with renewable energies, right? So geothermal and solar um, being the majority of that and, and design that is anticipating not only meeting all of the needs on the island, but actually producing even more than that. Um, net zero water, so very extensive, you know, catching of rainwater and re, you know, cleaning and recirculating. Those kinds of things will be part um, of this building. It's a really uh, going to be an impressive and exciting thing to see. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So these two buildings, one is predominantly a research building to hold those labs that Kevin was talking about and the other predominantly an educational building to hold those other activities, whether it is you know, undergraduate students studying there for um, a semester or visiting K to 12 students or um, you know, visiting people who are there for a short research stint. You know, it's gonna be flexible space that can be used um, in a variety of different ways. Uh, next slide, please. Um, So this gives you a sense of what it would look like as you're coming off the pier. Um, You know, the the island is only accessible by ferries, uh, which poses a whole bunch of fascinating challenges. (laughs) And another of the reasons why SUNY Maritime is such a great partner for us, because they know how to do this work. Right. Um, And but anyway, you can get a sense of, you know, what what these buildings uh, will be looking like. Um, Part of the design is also to create a living shoreline. Um, And so if I could go to the next slide. So um, removing the seawall in this area and creating the kind of living shorelines that we know from the research that our faculty and SOMAS have been doing for a long time is actually the ways in which you need your urban environments to be in order to respond better to the larger storms and the bigger swells that we're getting out of those storms um, for a city to work, right? And so we'll be able to demonstrate and continue the research right here in New York Harbor. Um, And that will become instructive for what urban environments around the world um, are gonna need to do moving forward. We've tended to build a lot of seawalls And guess what? Those seawalls are no longer sufficient, right? Because our oceans are rising, our storms are getting bigger, um, sea swells are larger, um, et cetera. So very exciting to be able to have this as well. Um, And I think that's all the slides we have for, yep. So that gives you a sense of some of what our living laboratory is gonna be like and what we're so excited about. But an important piece of this is that you also understand how we're structuring it financially in order to protect Stony Brook University. Um, There is a seawall, we could call it, but a really tall one, one that is strong enough um, to survive bigger storms uh, to protect Stony Brook University. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jed to talk a little bit about our structure and finances and so forth. Thank you. So uh, just a few quick basic concepts about this. I think probably the most important one is that this is not Stony Brook University creating a campus at Governor's Island, right, organizational. This is a independent 501c3 not-for-profit entity that we have already created with a board of directors, the 
president is the chair, I'm actually the first treasurer of the organization. And uh, we will start to operate this entity and have started to operate it, uh, you know, as of the signing of the PDA just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's the first thing. So this is not about Stony Brook University, other than the fact that we are the lead, the anchor, and we control 50%, but not a majority of the voting seats. And those are important concepts. And the reason for that is because uh, no dollars from Stony Brook University may be used to support this entity. And what I mean by that is we cannot utilize dollars from our books to say, for example, contribute to the capital that's required to build the facility. If uh, during any period of time, if this uh, you know, operating entity starts to get into financial trouble, Stony Brook University dollars cannot be used to bail it out. So that's the other part of it. Now, there is going to be a financial relationship, though, once this becomes operational. And that financial relationship is exactly what Kevin talked about. We're going to have faculty there. We're going to have students there. We're going to have staff there. And there will be some kind of ongoing you know, relationship, which will be the same as all the other folks that are there. So that is really the extent to which um, you know, there will be you know, involvement. It's significant. It's substantial, and obviously, we're the anchor. This really is powered by us. And I think those are, but those are the important concepts. So I've talked about, as the president said, there's an impermeable wall relative to the assets of Stony Brook University and this entity that we have created. So I think really important uh, for people to come away with that. Just to give you a sense, any, any questions about that? Chad, any, any SUNY dollars involved? None. No, in dollars. fact, I think. Honestly, one of the big issues is the full faith and credit of Stony Brook University at SUNY or the state of New York is not involved in this project. And I think that's something that, you know, actually we really tried to make sure of. It was a substantial item. Judy and I had the honor of being part of the negotiation team during this process. And that's something that we really made sure that everybody understood that that was the incoming condition of our participation. So it's, it, it doesn't reflect what I would argue is the miracle of this taking place. And if I may, just to give you an idea, you know, when you look at universities that come together, mostly, say, for example, the federal government is offering dollars to get all the entities to work together to focus on an issue. Here, we have come together, all the partners that you've seen, and we are focusing on an issue based upon this idea that we started out with. And we are also generating the philanthropic support to make this happen. It's really remarkable, and I would argue quite unusual in America today. So really quite amazing, honestly. Anyway, it's just now to flip over into the numerical side of this thing. So the capitalization for this is probably going to be about $700 million, plus or minus about 10%. Uh, as you heard, we already have $150 million of philanthropic support. In addition, we have $100 million coming from the city, which is a reimbursement for what will be actual construction costs. And it'll probably go to the first project that we engage, is, that engage in that's of sufficient size to absorb that funding, right? So we're, if you figure that this is going to be you know, plus minus $700 million, and we already have 250 million, that's not bad, but you know, we have a long way to go, as the president said. We basically have up to about uh, 30 months to design this project, and then we have another 36, we have uh, coterminous with that, we have up to 36 months to uh, raise the funds to make this happen. Now, one of the interesting um, aspects of this is that the, really what's happening right now to, to firm up the dollars is we're embarking in the construction, you know, the design part which will eventually lead to construction documents. And that's, and then of course to bid. And that's when you really understand what the true capital dollars of this will be. And what, in essence, we'll be you know, kind of moving forward with raising money, and at the same time understanding more and more with greater accuracy what the actual capital rise will be. And that's really how this is gonna play out. I would say the last part of this, and as Kevin talked about, is everything that Kevin talked about, now I have to say, I'm reducing this to my world, is all about revenue generating, right? There's going to be expenses of this entity, but there'll be revenue. 
Students will come, they will, you know, take classes there, that generates revenue. Students, faculty and staff may live there, that generates revenue. Uh, we may get grants and contracts from the federal government and other sponsors, that generates revenue. So all these things are baked into the pro forma. And then my last point will be, there is in the pro forma about $150 million of debt. That's just in case we don't, we're not able to raise all the money. And the 150 comes from what we think the pro forma on an ongoing operating basis can, you know, sustain. So that is really in a nutshell the, the, the uh, finances and then the key aspects of the structure. A any questions? <clears throat> What's the time frame for, I guess, step one? I know you're, you outlined a lot of things here, but at what point do you put a shovel in the ground? <laughs> Well, I say, uh, I think this is like 28, 29 is probably the okay. likely time for the season. That's already. to be built. Yeah. Right. Shovel, right, right. shovel oh, in the ground, 25. Yeah. We right. Know. Okay. Three years. Three. Two to three, three years. years. Okay. Two to three years. So during that process, Sorry. design, design, and, and doing the raising the right. money. Right. So the programming yeah. will start immediately. Yep. Oh. So oh. Kevin's leading, you know, both our academic partners and our community partners in conversations okay. about how do we immediately <clears> begin to stand up some of the research areas how do we immediately help amplifying the work of our economic um, training, green force training right. partners? Um, so a lot will start happening. So utilizing summer. some of the facilities that are already on the island. Uh, they're not really ready to be utilized. Oh, okay. um, the Coast Guard buildings, uh, we'll just say, are in a bit of disrepair, <laughs> um, having been empty for over 20 years oh, cool. um, and at more than end of life when they were left 20 years ago. So, so how does the fundraising work? I know that apparently we've raised 250, but what are the core partners doing with the anchor partner? So the core partners are working with us. Um, mm -hmm. They're bringing some of their own philanthropic dollars to mm -hmm. the table and a lot of their own philanthropic relationships. So to the who's table. your fundraiser on behalf, the principal fundraiser on behalf of the core partner? Well, right okay. now it is, you know, the VP of every institution is kind of partnering together. We are soon going to be hiring an executive director of the New okay. York Climate Exchange, and Good. then we'll be hiring a development officer for the New York Climate Exchange. Okay. So the energy will shift from the VPs of the core partners having to be the ones pitching in, and this will be in a matter of months, yeah. right, um, to really having an executive director of the fundraising for the New York Climate Exchange. <clears throat> um, so it will have its own staff um, so that it is not pulling all the time um, of the people here. And some of the initial gifts can be used for those operational expenses Correct. to get exactly. the, the executive director and the new development officer off the ground. Exactly. Right. Okay. right. Yeah, makes sense. I had one question for Kevin. Uh, Kev, um, uh, if, uh, yeah, if you said it, I, um, I'm sorry if I missed it. But the opportunities for students on the, at the new facility, uh, they don't have to be a SOMA student. They could be an undergrad or a grad student in other areas and might be able to take advantage of uh, courses or seminars there? Yeah, so the focus would be if we built, be we open to everyone, right? So, that, you know, anyway, from a pre-med to an English major. And the idea is that the programming will really be focused around hands-on learning around sustainability <coughs> and climate solutions. It won't necessarily be technical, right? So it's not STEM-focused at all. There might be tracks that are more, more STEM-focused and tracks that are more arts-focused. but the idea is that it would be open to all of our students and all of the students at our partners' campuses as well. Pretty good, it's exciting. You know, um, it, it, it really is uh, exciting news. Uh, you, you, yeah. you hardly heard any excitement in Maury's uh, uh, presentation, <laughs> but it's really important, it well. important to understand the history. This island was owned by um, the uh, army for over a hundred years, uh, used by Coast the Guard, uh, but used by right. um, uh, the federal government for years, and then. Uh, you need to have a vision, and Mayor Bloomberg at the time, 20 yeah. years ago, he yep. accepted the property for free from the feds. A lot of people laughed at him and said, ah, why do you want this headache yeah, for? He's a visionary, you can Exactly. Say. But now, now he was at the time, and it's continued with de Blasio, then it continued with Mayor mm -hmm. Adams. And I had the privilege of um, being on Governor's Island when Maury and Mayor Adams um, uh, made the announcement, and Maury did a fantastic job. And it really is significant, I believe, for the university. I mean, we'd like to think that everybody knows this as this amazing international research university, but a lot of people in the metropolitan region still view us as a great university on Long Island. On Long Island, right. <laughs> and, you know, by having more, we had a little bit of a campus on Park Avenue for years. It was sort of 
Yeah. It wasn't much of a presence. This is going to give us a presence in the city. And as Maury said to all these new partners, uh, new potential um, students, as well as new potential donors. So really is a game changer, really puts us on the map in the New York City metropolitan region. So uh, really kudos, Maury, to you and I'm your team. I'm glad they recognize they're in the state. I mean, that's very important for our institution to do, that you're the face yeah. of this institution. So thank you very much on the heart of it. Yeah, exactly. And your team. Right. Yeah. Wonderful so, team. Yeah, yes. I so. mean, this has been um, a incredible work by a very large number of people on our campus um, who've really brought and helped define this vision and given this vision life as well as the kind of practicality it's going to need to succeed. So relationships that have been built over the last two years and really visionary programming that's been built by the team that's been engaged in I mean, this work. I think work, it's remarkable so. to bring together the partners that you have. I mean, that in itself yeah. is just amazing that uh, that it was done. Yeah. And, yeah. and obviously it's a credit to the team that put it together. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, exactly. Remarkable work. So we're excited. We're, we share the excitement with yeah. you and the team. and. Look forward to periodic updates, uh, future get. meetings. And so uh, best of luck to you. Thank and you. Con congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. So turning our attention to Albany, Judy, yeah, so, would you like to say uh, yeah, so, uh, a few um, extra words Judy, about? I'm, I'm, I'm going to just preface it. Judy, you and Carl, you and Carl have 32 minutes. Yes. And you guys could decide to divvy up 16 minutes each. Or, I am ready for 32 minutes, Judy. <laughs> no, but so just uh, as we manage time. But um, so yeah, I think you both have enough time to go through your presentations. I, I will speed talk and give Carl as much time. All right. Um, Don't have to rush, just was um, reminded. Um, I've been watching my <laughs> um, So just uh, quickly, the enacted budget was passed. I, I was about to say finally, but finally passed on May 2nd. Um, it was uh, hard to wait for. Um, it was a long delay from when it was supposed to be done, which is March 31st. Um, overall, it's a $229 billion budget, and it's 4% over last year's uh, budget. Um, made significant investments in K-12 and higher education. I haven't, in my entire time here, said that second part, which is significant investment in higher education. So for eight years, I've been waiting to say that line. <laughs> um, yay. Um, along with the MTA, mental health. There are also a number of policy changes within the budget, which I'll show you a slide at the very end. Those are things that often slide into a budget. Uh, they don't necessarily have significant budget impact, but it's the way that in the end, the three people in the room get to close a budget is by coming together on some of the policy issues. Those very policy issues, like changes to the state's bail laws, housing, other things are what sometimes keep it from coming to a final moment, but it did come to a mm -hmm. final moment. If you could move to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a little bit how higher education became a priority in the state budget. This really was the best um, budget for Stony Brook in many, many years, and it really was the result of our steady advocating, and also that the governor really hasn't wavered since naming Stony Brook as a flagship in January of 2022. Um, and at that time, we were thrilled to have been named a flagship, but also pointed out that to be a flagship means something different in terms of the way that we're funded um, than it has been. And that we were not going to be able to compete with our AAU peers and to do the kind of, um, be the kind of institution that we are uh, without some support. And so the governor's executive budget laid out essentially all the pillars. She talked about raising tuition. She talked about it, um, an endowment matching program. She had significant capital upgrades. The assembly and the Senate had twists on that. Um, the most significant was that the speaker was adamantly opposed to increasing tuition in any way. Um, and so then it became a conversation with him as to what would be an alternative. Um, and what I would say is he became, uh, he this year made higher education his priority as well. And so you had the governor making a priority, you had the speaker making a priority, then it was how are we gonna pull this together? Um, if you could go to the next. 
Um, and so, you know, we still had to make a significant, um, we still had to work on why invest in SUNY, why invest in Stony Brook, why invest in a flagship, why invest in a research institution. And we had to make that case, and, you know, just to remind everybody, um, right? We'd had no operating aid increase since 2011. We've had no tuition increase since 2019. It's impossible for any higher education institution to operate with those two sentences. It's impossible for any institution to operate that way. It's particularly impossible for a research institution like we are. And so we have made, we spent a lot of time working with legislatures and with, with legislators and with the governor um, to truly understand what that means. Um, and we also spent time with them on uh, working to help them to really see what it means that the, uh, the cost of the labor contracts, past labor contract, is now equaling about 90% of our state support. So all, almost all of our state support, which again hasn't increased in over 10 years, almost all of our state support goes just to the increases in the last contract. Not the base, not anything else, just to the increases. And I think that people in Albany have just gotten like, yeah, 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 the CSIs. But, you know, yeah, we understand. We needed to really help them understand the impact of that, which really for us was a $10 million cut every year. The only way we could fund the CSIs was to not hire, or was to do not do the things that we needed to do. And I think that that was finally why we had some success this year, that people really began to understand that. Um, and additionally, our capital needs are greater at Stony Brook. You know, as Mari noted, $2.1 billion in deferred maintenance, largest in the SUNY system. Um, we're, and we're in a more expensive place to fix things, and we have more expensive facilities than many of the other institutions in the SUNY system because of the research labs. So all of that was what we worked on with laser precision to help legislators and others understand the issues. Um, our priorities were, you know, um, differential tuition and increased operating aid, increased flexible capital, endowment, and state coverage of hospital debt service, as well as a few other things in the in the healthcare area. Um, we were really fully engaged on all of those, and um, and we're particularly interested in helping leg the legislature understand what is an endowment match. What does it mean that 20 some other states have done this a long time ago? Um, and, and how it sets an institution on a long-term path to stability, as well as some of the capital issues um, that you know, I think Mari noted, sometimes you can rehab a building and that's great. Other times that building just doesn't work anymore, even if you rehab and you're gonna pour a lot of money into that building when actually doing new. That wasn't the way the state of New York was structured, and so we spent quite a bit of time helping people at the Department of Budget at SUNY to understand that there may be some buildings on this campus that would be better to either take down or use for something other than science and to build a new building. And so that, you know, we call it the Jet Shivers provision, but that, um, that was a significant part of our advocacy change. Um, so where did we end up? Um, no increase for in-state tuition, but an increase for out-of-state tuition um, at the graduate level and at the undergrad level. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, but there was a concerted effort, particularly by the speaker, to get us in operating aid what we would have gotten from the governor's proposal for tuition for youth centers. And so that was how they um, framed their search for operating aid dollars. Whatever we would have gotten from the governor's proposal, they would provide an operating aid. Um, our uh, concern about that is we didn't want to see that as a one year, right? Tuition increases, it is what it is. We didn't want to see a one year increase. Do we hire, could we not hire? Like what would a one year increase mean in operating aid? And so they committed to at least two more years of an increase. Um, and they put that language in, um, in the financial uh, 
plan of the state. So it really shows, which is something that they give to Wall Street, and which really shows the world our intention is in the next two years, we would keep increasing this. Helpful. Um, we need to keep going. We actually, that kind of brings us to steady state. It doesn't provide us with a ton more to invest. We are thrilled not to have to make another $10 million cut to fund the CSIs. We also have our eyes on the next contract, which will be, you know, perhaps settled in soon, and so are hopeful that they will then fund that as well. On the capital side, um, a significant success. Um, there was, a for the first time ever, $100 million for Stony Brook, $100 million for University of Buffalo for research laboratories and, and other things around research. That's never happened. The state's never recognized the different cost structures that we have. Um, and so the two flagships got that, as well as um, this flexibility in terms of being able to use uh, some of the SUNY capital money for, for new as opposed to just fixing old. Um, on the endowment, okay. on the endowment matching program again, um, it's one to two match. There's five, it's a total of five hundred million. We have the opportunity to get two hundred million for, and then after three years to get a bit more. Um, our goal is to get a bit more, um, <laughs> so, as you might imagine. Um, but again, that provides some long term stability. Um, and then, um, not foot. On healthcare, I would say that the healthcare side, hospitals and healthcare system generally in New York State didn't quite fare as well as higher education did. Um, although there were increases to Medicaid reimbursement, they are much less than what the industry was hoping for. Um, there were some cuts to safety net hospital funding. The governor proposed a $700 million cut. The legislature brought back $500 million, so there's a $200 million cut overall. Um, this is not Stony Brook Hospital. This is statewide safety net hospitals. Um, for us, one of the things that we truly worked hard at was to have the state pick up the debt service for Stony Brook University Hospital. They had done it last year for the first time, to about $23 million, and they will continue that this year, which will give us about $27 million in budget relief, which is a really significant help. Um, the hosp SUNY hospitals were the only buildings in the state for which the state didn't pick up debt service mm -hmm. until last year. Um, there's a few other campus priorities. We, we um, maintained funding for our Center for Clean Water. We maintained a, mil a million dollar grant for the Sunburn Cancer Center. Our um, Centers of Excellence and Centers for Advanced Technology uh, maintain funding at a, at a million dollars. That's always a conversation at the legislature. And mm -hmm. our C grant program um, that we run with Cornell received an increase to a million dollars. So, terrific. Next slide. Um, and then, you know, finally I just would highlight some of the other issues. These are, many of these were the other issues that the s parties um, were negotiating while all of the things that we were working on were happening and that obviously every other part of the budget, um, you know, from minimum wage, criminal, criminal justice, natural gas, charter schools, housing, I mean, these were sort of the bigger policy issues. Almost e all of them highly charged political issues that people were working on while they tried to craft a budget. Um, and these are the kind of things that kind of can derail a budget or can make it happen. Um, and so, that is it. And the only other thing that I want to say is that I want to thank Carl Mills, who is our AVP for, I don't know his full title, but Carl, um, you know, spent long hours in Albany, long hours on Long Island, meeting with the delegation, meeting with the Department of Budget, meeting with SUNY folks, and really making sure that our views were known. Mari went up to Albany a few times. <laughs> we had a lot going on up there. Um, and Carl was a good partner in helping it happen. So. Great job, Judy. Uh, very good presentation. I have two questions for you. Um, and, and Fox, um, I know we like to compare ourselves to the other AEAUs and we wish we had a lot of their tuition structures, but if you just look in the tri-state region, what is a Rutgers tuition compared to Stony Brook and what is UConn's you know, 
uh, yeah. tuition compared to us. So we have all of that. We're the lowest of all of our Northeast regional peers by a lot, by a lot. Um, so I can get you the oh, chart. They're both yeah. in the upper teens. Yeah. I can just tell you, so we're around 10 in state. You come to so tuition and fees, we're about 10. 17, 18, out of state, we're around 27, 28. UConn is 42. Oh my God. Rutgers isn't quite We're as at much. 10. We're 10 at 10 in state. state. 10 and 20. And that's tuition and fees. They're at 18 and 42. Right. So 14,000 wow. more out of state. And, yeah. For and a would, non AAU. That's right. And I would tell you that even if we had gone up to the amount that the governor had put in her original proposal, we would still be at the bottom of the By a lot. By a lot. Okay. We would say, it's just, you know, again, our tuition is very low for what we do. I'm not suggesting that families don't have a hard time right, paying right. for that tuition, but it is low in comparison to our peers. Um, and we're in a high, relatively high cost area. So no. there's a huge difference, huge difference in our a a both AAU public peers and our Northeast regional peers. Got it. Huge difference in those. Right. And the other thing that is a significant difference is if you look at our AAU peers, including the publics, they almost all have significantly larger endowments than we do. And that money also helps fund their annual operating expenses. Out of 65 AAU institutions, our endowment is the 63rd, right? So we have 300 million where most of our AAU public peers have billions. Wow. Right, and billions <clears throat> throws off at 4.5%, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars that are part of your annual expenses every year. And we don't have that, right? So we have neither tuition, state aid, or endowment at levels that match our peers. And that's why um, you have seen the erosion in yeah. what we can do um, over the last decade. Really, it's amazing. And, it's amazing. And, and, um, and part of that's a function of sort of the Northeast built endowments for private colleges and there was an assumption that the state would pay for the publics and in part is that we're a young institution but the endowment match program begins to change this dynamic right. and that's why that became so important I think the governor understood that I think the legislature understood yeah, sure. that 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 endowment match is going to help to change that dynamic right. and so it won't make a huge difference for us Quickly, you know, endowment is a slow thing to build, but three presidents from now, they're going to be saying, I'm so glad that this happened three decades ago, right? Because it will grow and build over time. I, I, we signed a 99 year lease. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're here. Yeah. Yeah. Jude, my second question is uh, uh, Kevin, sorry, uh, real, just one other thing, just to give you an idea of the top 50 publics more than half of which aren't AAU, we have the fourth lowest out of state tuition. And so. And that seems like a logical place yeah. where they can move. Yes. And so, got it. Uh, one question before um, Maury signs her 33 year extension. Um, <laughs> um, and that is, uh, they, um, the advocates made a really good argument this year on minimum wage uh, in terms of. 2019, you know, the, the inflation rate over the last four years. And you're saying we haven't had a tuition increase since 19, and all of our costs have gone up as well. Right. Um, but rather than do the drama every couple of years of dealing, you know, they finally agreed to index the future increases to minimum wage to the cost of living. And has there ever been an attempt to index tuition yes. to COLA? And take the drama out every two years in over. Exactly. And why why oh, wouldn't they agree to something like that? Because Wonderful. the arguments are similar. It's a minimum wage. Wonderful question. Um, it's exactly the proposal that we had this year. That do an increase and then tie future increases to happy, which is the higher ed price index. I think it's incredibly reasonable. It also takes the politics out of it. It also allows families to understand what's happening in the future. Predictability. Complete predictability for students, complete predictability for the institution. The legislature can see it that way. 
right. we'll keep trying. Okay, very good. So, um, Judy, uh, good job, and uh, job. thanks for the presentation. Yeah. And Thank she you. stole a minute. They asked a lot of questions. Well, she stole a minute from you, so you got 14 minutes. <laughs> Provost, I'm, te I'm teasing. Do what you got to do. Provost Lejue has been leading our effort on uh, concluding our strategic planning process, which has been going on for over a year. And he's going to let you know where we are in this and um, the timeline for coming to finality. Great. And by the way, the UCs are almost 45,000 in Cal State. So when we think about who we're comparing ourselves to. The California to, schools. Uh, yeah. So, so there's, there's real proof. And so one of the important transitions now is we think about the potential to have some resources. And I, and I do want to just add one other thing. Hopefully the, the CSI's part, the way that Judy explained it, makes sense to you. I will tell you when I first got here, the idea that, because I thought, well, what's 3%? Like I didn't really get it. And then if you think about let's say for your academic unit, you lose 4% of your faculty every year, 4% attrition. If most of that state budget is people, which it is, and you have 3% increase and other kind of mandatory inflationary things, that's all that money. That's all, forget about like growing, forget about new opportunities. It actually sucks up all of it. And so it's it's impactful in a way that couldn't get through my head until I went through that first hiring cycle. So as we think <laughs> about what we're doing in our strategic planning, I just want to cover four things with us today. High level vision and values, priorities and objectives, and then where we're going in terms of next step. Just to be really clear, this has been going on for a long time. Rose has done, Rose Martinelli has done amazing work starting this over, well over a year ago with Project REACH, long before I arrived. So Project REACH is essentially a way of thinking about how as a university we are able to be really strategic when it comes to our resources, our aspirations, and our accomplishments. And so if you look at everything that has happened, this includes broad and and really broad and deep engagement with the Stony Brook community, starting to build what is our vision? Who are we? What do we want to accomplish? What are those central values about who we are? And then as we moved into this kind of next piece of the drafting the plan, and that's where we get into uh, the next piece of that and then the community forums. So this takes us October to January. So it's taking that work and really starting to say, okay, let's crystallize this. Let's involve the university leadership team. Let's really ensure that we've taken the community feedback and we're building it into a strong plan. This is included um, really kind of moving those towards finality, which is where we just recently gotten to. And now moving into this last piece of developing community forums that we just had to be able to now move into what are our um, initiatives and how are we gonna measure our success? One thing really important to think about, the strategic plan is aspirational. So you don't wanna weigh it down too much with a lot of minutia and details. So you have the bigger picture in the plan and then we'll have an annual action plan every year that will then be clear about, here's what we're gonna accomplish this year, and then we hold ourselves accountable to it. So what will be different from some other strategic plans is that every year we will be clear about what we want to accomplish, we'll hold ourselves accountable, and we'll do that in the public way. So if you think about these pieces, um, mission, that's stable, this is kind of the DNA of who we are. So where we focus in the strategic planning piece is in the values, the vision, and the priorities. That's the first piece I'll mention. Then we move on to objectives or initiatives. What are the outcomes and success measures? And then do we have the capabilities to accomplish this? That part's gonna be really crucial because a strategic plan that doesn't have the infrastructure, that doesn't have the resources, actually can hurt morale instead of helping it. 
So if you look at kind of where we are, we're kind of, as I said, moving towards that very final wordsmithing. So in the vision, something, if you think about strategic planning, on one side, there's the legitimacy story. That is, to what extent are we a legitimate top public flagship university like any of the UC schools, like Michigan, like North Carolina? And then there's the advantage story. In what ways are we unique? Are we different? And you see both in our vision. So we've really leaned into some of those advantage pieces of the idea of being a first choice. So I grew up not too far from here in New Jersey, and there just wasn't the level of respect for public flagship universities in this area that you see in every other part of the country. That's changing now. But the idea, and you know, I was the first person in my family to go away to college. The idea that I was going to be picky at that time seemed silly to me. But I never, no one encouraged me to go to a public school. It was just not what anyone thought about. And now that's changing. Now we are poised to be a first choice. Now we think of that for students, but also that we get the faculty member that we are trying to get in the quantum search. That when we think about our performance faculty, that we have world-class performers, and creative individuals across the whole gamut of the university. That the care that you get at our hospital and healthcare, that that is a first choice for patients. First choice is gonna run through everything that we do. That is an advantage story, that is something that is unique to us because for some other publics, they've already, you know, no one's really not thought of Michigan as the first choice. This is about that advantage that also brings the legitimacy. The other piece that's really unique about us is the social mobility. When you think about who we are in terms of being a top research university and also being able to be one of the top producers in terms of social mobility, moving someone from the bottom fifth of the income distribution to the top fifth. This is unique for us and it is something that when we look at this, you see the legitimacy of the public, the flagship, but really kind of doubling down on New York, the role that we play and the fact that we are able to have these unique aspects. And we do it all with the community values in mind. So when we think about any of the initiatives, anything we do, we always have to ask ourselves, is equity involved here? Have we created a hands-on student research experience that allows students who are low income to not have to pick between working a job or doing this research opportunity? If we don't get that right, if equity is not a value in everything we do, we create more disparities. Or innovation, have we done things the same old way? Or as we think about how do we move our graduation and retention rates to that next level, have we been innovative? Have we thought about doing things in unique ways? All of those values, we have to ask ourselves in everything we do, are we living our values and who we are and what's happening? And we did not have empathy. Empathy is, in fact, it might be surprising to some of you. <laughs> um, we're testing it out right now. Um, it's the idea that with all of it, it is about care for our people. Have to have excellence in there. If you wanna have a fist fight with someone who does strategic planning, ask whether excellence is a value and people just have very different views on this. Some would say it should not be a value. Where we are, it has to be front and center for that next ascension. So we're not going to get into the esoterics of it. We're just going to have it there. So as we think about those five values, excellence, collaboration, equity, innovation, and everything. And by the way, in your, the word small there, so I, I printed everything out for you. So then we get to priorities and objectives. These are the four things that are the flags that we are planting about what we are going to accomplish. And when we do, we will accomplish that vision. So again, going back to that vision, 
that leading flagship, <clears throat> first choice, driving innovation, excellence in healthcare, economic and cultural development, social mobility, how are we gonna do it? One, transforming learning and teaching. Two, expanding our research enterprise for impact. <clears throat> Three, and this one's really important to me when you think about what Judy talked about, how do we advocate for ourselves? Well, some of it is to ask, but some of it is to prove how valuable we are, how every investment pays off either through financial economic reasons for the state or for making the state a better place. So you think about how we're gonna serve our communities as a public flagship and then reimagining the way we work. This is another one where at other universities you may not need that fourth one, but we're a young university. Structures, of being able to create that clarity, that frictionless environment, we have to really focus on that. So if you think about these four priorities, if we were to accomplish things within this, so things like increasing student access, getting our graduation and retention rates up, being able to incubate ideas locally, being able to develop these collaborative partnerships, doing research that brings many different large economic development together, being able to think about how we are supporting our community and catalyzing the economy for New York, and how are we empowering our people and having facilities that work. If we did those things, we, would, we will accomplish that vision. Mm -hmm. So these things are all interconnected. And so where we are right now is that we are kind of refining the, the last pieces of this. We actually have a leadership team meeting tomorrow that will take a look at this. We'll be working through the draft into June, building out those initiatives and the metrics, and then bringing it out to the community one last time at the start of the fall and having a, a big launch in you know mid or so uh, September, early October. And then at that point, we have our annual action plan and you're, this is not a plan that'll sit in a shelf, it's a plan you'll actually be sick of because you'll be hearing so much about it. We'll be talking about everything in the framework of those priorities. So I'll just stop. Thank you. I would say, who's better than Paul? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 and I got a lot of words. Uh, you did, you did. Dan, that was and, But you know what, um, when we have our October meeting, We'll have you give a, you know, uh, just an update of the progress you made over the summer, but that's great, uh, Carl, and uh, it's important to have a plan. You know, Albert Einstein once said, if you aim for nothing, you'll hit it. And so it's very important that we have uh, some goals and some priorities and some objectives. So uh, nice job, and we look forward to hearing a, a further update from you in October. And you have proof there. If you see anything, you have any thoughts or ideas, email it because we're still kind of doing those final pieces. And if you saw where we started and where we got to with community and leadership feedback, it really looks very different. The wisdom of, of crowds is a, a big piece of how we've gone about this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other board member have any other matter they'd like to raise at this point? No? We have um, graduation May 19th. 19th. Good. Um, Congratulations to our Vice Chair, Linda Arman. Uh, she's not here with us today because her son has graduated, just graduated yesterday. Wow. Um, yeah. My son's graduating May 20th. So it's a, gonna be a month of college and, graduation. And mine on the 28th. And the 28th. Yeah. So congratulations to all college yeah. graduates, but look forward to seeing folks on uh, the 19th. And so uh, uh, Margo Grant makes a motion to adjourn, seconded by Errol Toulon. And all in favor? Aye. 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 We are done. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.